Okay, 1 Timothy chapter 3, I'm going to begin in the 14th verse. I'm going to read down through the 16th verse. And today's title of the message is, The Blessings Are Real. Everybody say that with me. The Blessings Are Real. These things I write to you, though I hope to come to you shortly. But if I am delayed, I write so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the ground of truth. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen by angels, preached among the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up in the glory. A wonderful summation, verse 16 is, of the ministry of Jesus Christ and the ministry that he continues to work through his church. But Paul writing to Timothy says, there are things that I want you to know before I arrive and elaborate on them a little bit more in, in detail. And so many times writing is a lost art in today's culture and not that technology has taken away that avenue of communication, but most of the time we lean on technology and we really don't go and write many handwritten letters the way that they did at one time in the world. But in Paul's day, the way the primary means of communication was through the written letter. And so he's writing and in his and in, in, in his instruction to Timothy, he says, you know, right now there could be a problem with me getting to you, so I write that you may know how you should conduct yourself in the house of God, which is the church. He identifies that as the church of the living God. We serve a God who is alive, a God who is living, the pillar and the ground of truth. There's two phrases here that I want to expound on that will help us to understand that why the blessings are real and why the church matters. And the first phrase is the pillar and ground of truth. The pillar and the ground of truth. Now we understand uh, that what the purpose of a pillar is. It's to uphold something. It's to uphold something. So if you're building a structure and you're building it on a pillar or a pier foundation, those pillars or piers are to uphold that building. So a pillar is very important in, in that it gives support. It gives support. And then ground is fundamental or foundational. When you think about doing something at ground level, you talk about breaking the ground or laying the ground or laying the legwork. And so when you think about this phrase, what the apostle is saying to the church and to his son in the faith is the call of the church is to uphold the truth of God. The call of the church is to uphold the truth of God and not to change it, not to substitute it with tradition, not to substitute it with culture, identity issues, but to understand our call, our call as a church is to uphold the truth. Now, there are other expressions and other avenues in which people deal with other issues that are important in the world in which we live in social injustices and things along those manners. There are organizations and institutions that are raised up, and that is their primary goal and purpose. Our primary goal and purpose as the church, as a body of Christ, as a fellowship of believers, is to preserve and protect the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that comes under attack because the enemy of our soul and the enemy of the soul of every human being is out to deceive and to blind lest the light of the glorious gospel shine through and the truth of the gospel break through into the heart of an individual and they be changed by Christ. So the enemy is opposing us. That's what an enemy does. He's adversarial. He's accusational. And so we understand those things about our enemy, but still our calling remains the same, to be pillars and to do the work to uphold the truth as it's found in Christ. And that is an honorable work. And that is something that we are all 
to participate in. And when we do that, there's a blessing that comes with it. When you and I support and stand for the truth, there's a blessing associated with it, and it's a real blessing. It's not something that's just stored up for you one day in heaven. It's something that God will pour out upon you while you're here on the earth because our God desires to bless us, to provide for us, to sustain us, and to strengthen us so that we can be pillars of righteousness, so that we can be his people that uphold the standard of the truth. Now, uh, the spirit in which we do it should never be dis- divisive, should never be combative. It should be compassionate. It should be Christ-like. It should bring glory to God. It should whet someone's appetite if they're an enemy of the Lord. It should create an opportunity for a conversation instead of a debate. And so the way we uphold the truth and the way that we are called to preserve the truth is in love. Is that the Spirit of Christ that dwells within us compels us, the love of God compels us to preserve the truth, not to present ourselves as holier than thou, but so that people would know the truth and the truth of the gospel would be able to register on their heart and they would know the reality of God's love. So this is one of the primary calls of the church that brings blessings to humanity. So there was a gentleman that came into my life in the fall of 1976, and he told me the truth about Christ, and the blessings have been real ever since. When I said yes to Jesus, I entered into a blessed assurance. I entered into a blessed relationship because now I'm blessed with every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus in heavenly places. I was repositioned. I got a new name, a new nature, and God is continuing to work in me all these years later. The blessings are real. The blessings are real for you. Sometimes because of the pressures of life, the pace of life, you know, we just sort of get caught up in not realizing how blessed we are. And, you know, sort of out of sight, out of mind kind of thing, if we... If we get the Lord away from our eyes or away from, you know, his word away from our eyes, then it sort of dissipates from our mind. It just disappears. And yet the moment that we're reminded of our calling and God's placement and his purpose for our life, oh, how those embers are rekindled. I want to remind you that in your spirit there is truth, truth that you've heard some of you since you were children, and that truth is in your spirit. But if we don't protect and guard and keep our heart, the enemy will come and he will sow seeds that will try to get us to be confused, try to get us off course, try to pull us over into the flesh, try to get us to, you know, just lean on our own understanding and our own rationale. But the moment that the truth is presented again, it bears witness with our spirit where all truth is preserved by the Spirit of God. You know, see, the devil doesn't have access to your spirit. And even as you're sitting under the Word of God this morning, here in person or there online, the Word of God is likened to a seed and it's being sown into your spirit again. It's also likened to the process of gardening in that once a seed is sown, that seed is going to be watered. And all the while, God is working in us by His Spirit. Where is He working? In your spirit. And in your spirit, there's a yes and a knowing and an amen when you hear the truth as it's found in Scripture. As a believer, you're alive unto God. God's Word is alive unto you. And when that living Word is in your heart, it begins to bring blessings in the remembrance of blessings to us. How blessed we are. You know, when we get angry, you know your mind doesn't work. And the Holy Spirit said, the Holy Spirit, Jesus said this about the Holy Spirit. He'll bring the word to your remembrance. But you know, if the enemy can get you and I worked up and angry and fighting and fussing and divisive, then our mind is not operative at that time. 
we're completely given over to the impulses of the flesh. We want an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. We want to justify our wrongs. We want someone to pay a price. We want to pound the flesh for everything that anyone ever did to us that caused us harm. And at that mind, your, your intellect is completely checked out. And you're just acting like a brute beast. I'm acting like a brute beast. It's the lowest level of behavior for a human being who's created in the image of God to go around and behave that way. But when we hear the truth again in our heart or in our spirit, we're reminded of who we are. And when we're reminded of who we are, it bears witness with us that we are the people of God. We once who were not a people, as Peter said, are now the people of God and we're to show forth his praises. Amen. That is a wonderful description of how our day in and day out life should be. We at one time were not a people, B.C., before Christ. We are now a people because we came to Christ and the good work that God started, he's going to begin as we sing forth his praises. I love the testimony of Ava because she did what the Lord asked her to do and the Lord did exceedingly abundantly above all she could ever imagine. She thought it was going to be an ordinary week of camp. It ended up being extraordinary, but it wouldn't have been if she would have just sat there or stood there and not entered in. But the Lord said, if you would give yourself to worship, the blessings will be real. And they were, and they'll continue to be real. Prior to service, we sat in our office and I said, you know, one of the, the most challenging things to do now is to protect that which God has deposited within you. But you know, she has a wonderful support system. She has a wonderful family, good siblings, a great mom and dad. She's got wonderful friends. But to say that the enemy isn't going to come and try to distract her or cause her to go on a detour we wouldn't be telling her the truth. But what we can say to her and to everybody else yeah. is your story is real and don't let anyone yeah. take it from you. Yeah. And the more that you praise and the more you worship the Lord, the solid foundation that you have just goes and the root system of that foundation just goes deeper and deeper and deeper. So the second phrase is the house of God. Everybody say the house of God. This is a phrase that uses to describe a, communi a community of believers. And so God not only wants us to preserve and to protect and to proclaim the truth, you know, that that's something the church is responsible for. And he's raised up the church for that very purpose, Jesus being the chief cornerstone or the first one that was resurrected from the dead. And we are living stones that are added to that Ephesus or that spiritual work called the church. But this institution or this organization, or we would, would call it this organism because we're alive unto God, because we serve a living God, is called, is called to be a community. So if the enemy can get us out of community, he can end up doing a destructive work in our life. And a community is where everybody works to contribute and to do their part and to take their place. That's what makes it a community. Every member is specifically placed. Every member has a grace. Every member is important. And the Apostle Paul uses our physical body to help us with that analogy. And he even identifies and says this, hey, I get it. Some parts are more recognizable than others. But the ones that you don't see are vitally important because they're the ones behind the scenes or the ones that maybe are not up in front that are actually causing the whole body to be built up together into the head. So we have what we would call, right, external organs and we have internal organs. So you understand the analogy, therefore, to the body of Christ. The largest organ physically that we have is our skin. It's a living, breathing part of who you are. Right? But encased within this flesh are all 
of the other vital organs that allow this flesh to have expression. One illustration and then we'll move on. The people that spend time praying for the body of Christ, praying for the lost, praying, are usually doing privately. They're in their prayer closet. But because of their prayers, those other members that are out in the highways and byways are able to express the gospel more freely. Prayer brings a blessing. So all members of the body of Christ are necessary, and we understand none of us can show disrespect or devalue any other member of the body of Christ because when we do that, we disrespect and we devalue ourselves because we're part of that same body. Though the church, and let me give you some other descriptive phrases for the church, the body of Christ, the bride of Christ, the family of God, those who are alive to God through the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, God's beloved, God's offspring, his sons and daughters, the church, it was all God's plan. Community has always been the plan of God. We see a portion of that revealed in the Old Testament, but now within the New Testament, we see something new and better, which I'm going to elaborate on here in a moment. But Hebrews 11.40 is a wonderful portion of Scripture. The first portion of the Scripture says, God having provided something better for us. It's the last verse, Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 40. It's the last verse of Hebrews chapter 11. And how many of you know what Hebrews chapter 11 is? Hebrews chapter 11 is the great chapter of faith. And it talks about all those who served the Lord by faith. And it said, but some of them did not obtain the promises. And then it gives us this phrase. God having provided something better for us. You can take that down off the screen, Christian. God having provided something better for us. Let's talk about that something better because that's where the blessings are. The blessings include the salvation of God that God has provided by faith. The something better includes God's people being positioned with God as sons and daughters. And God's doing something in us. Something better is still to come. So I want to give you sort of an analogy or sort of a breakdown or an overview of the book of Hebrews and I don't mean this to be academic. I think that it's, uh, it's important that we understand that every book of the Bible has a specific placement by the Spirit of God and a message that humanity needs to understand and embrace in order to be fully developed and to be fully fed and nurtured in the things of God. In the book of Hebrews, if you read it, it can get a little wordy. It can get a little heady. I mean, it, it deals with the high priesthood, it deals with a lot of sacrificial language that took place in the Old Testament. And let me just sort of maybe give you a little caveat there as far as offerings and sacrifices and things that took place under the Old Testament. If you read the book of Leviticus and if, you know, you ever just want to get a little bit of, uh, a, you know, you're having a hard time sleeping and you just want something to help you to get over the hump, you know, you can read the book of Leviticus, which was the responsibility of the Levitical priesthood, which was a, a specific tribe that God had raised up among his people. They were the Levites. And uh, this was their duty and their responsibility. Read the Levitical responsibilities. We could say it's their job description. And if you read the Levitical account that's given in the Old Testament, you'd be like, man, that's demanding. And I would even put it in this category. That's like an impossible task. Humanly speaking, it's impossible. And that was the whole purpose of God giving them all of the responsibility and all of the different ways in which they were to bring offerings and sacrifices was that the message from God to mankind is 
you can't do and this kind of worship or lifestyle is unsustainable. You're going to fail. You're going to burn out. You're going to get over into pride, into self-righteousness. But it's impossible. So Jesus came and Jesus became our high priest unto God. And he is the only one who was able to fulfill all the duties and the responsibilities of a priest before God and to offer up all of the sacrifices in an acceptable way so that we could be blessed. So when Jesus came, he had a lot of responsibilities to fulfill. And he did them all with the help and the person of the Holy Spirit. So because of that, Scripture now calls us blessed. Everybody say blessed. blessed. Say it again, blessed. blessed. And the blessings are real. And the blessings of God are described in the book of Hebrews with this singular word, better. God's blessing because of Jesus Christ are better. Because of the church are better. And let me give you, let me see, one, two, three, four, five, six. Six ways in which the blessings are better because of Jesus. Are you guys ready? You say, how long are we going to be here? Not long. And the more that you participate, the greater the flow is. So everybody say better sacrifice. Better sacrifice. Let's go back. Book of Leviticus. Every time you blew it, every time you made a mistake, every time you failed and sinned before God, which is what? Not keeping his commandments, his statutes, his ordinances. Whenever man slipped and fell, missed the mark is the word for sin in the New Testament. If you miss the mark, and the mark is, right, the word of God, the standards of God. It's not our culture. It's not clothesline preaching. But you know, sins of the flesh are still sins of the flesh. Old Testament, New Testament. Sins of omission, sins of commission, still the same. They haven't changed. But the way God deals with us as people has changed because of Christ. God deals with us in a much better way now. So in the Old Testament, if I blew it, you know, I've got to go round up an animal. How hard is it to... to you ever try to catch a turtle dove? A goat? A bull? How, you want to bring a bull? You ever tried to chase down a bull? Who, who in here wants to be... Like a wrangler. Let's go get, hey, what'd you do today? Man, I really blew it. I got to offer up a bull. Or a calf. You ever tried to catch a calf? I've been to a lot of rodeos growing up. It's entertaining when they try to get in there and catch the calf. When the bull comes in the ring, the clown shows up to try to protect those that are riders. Why? Because no one wants to mess with the bull. These are the animals that they had to bring to God, right, and sacrifice them. And their blood had to be shed. And what kind of animals? Innocent animals. I mean, it was tedious. It was hard work. It was demanding. It, it was condemning. They felt guilty. Where are you going? Well, yeah, got to go catch a turtle dove today. Why is that? Well, I told my mom she's number one, but I gave her the wrong finger to tell her that. Well, <laughs> Yeah, that's, uh, that's not honoring your father and mother. That's, uh, that's one of the big ten. Um, you, you better go get a turtle dove. Well, that's bigger. You might, you might have to go wrestle a calf. You want to come with me? No, no, I, I, didn't, I didn't give that expression to my parents today. Okay, okay, okay. So you understand that, I mean, it, it was like demanding, tough, and you felt shame and guilt all the time. You just live with this awareness of shame and guilt. You know, there's some people that they come to Christ. Cute little caveat here. And I promise this is probably the most elaborate of the six because everything else unfolds after this. There's a better sacrifice. There's a better sacrifice. But um, when I came to Christ as 13 years of age, and then I started growing in fact, honestly, when I first came to Christ, if I didn't feel bad, I don't know that I felt good about myself. I, I always felt like I was just, just one notch below everybody else, you know, 
I was uh, a french fry short of a happy meal. My elevator didn't go to the top. I mean, you know, all of the adages and, and some that, you know, probably aren't appropriate for the platform uh, is how I felt. You know, if I, and I, I lived with an awareness of my shortcomings, my inadequacies, my failures, and my number one conversation with God for the se first several years that I was saved was God forgive me. I felt like I was failing him constantly until I learned this truth that I'm about to share with you. And that is that Jesus is a perfect sacrifice. Those animals, those innocent animals, they just covered the sins. Because of Jesus' better sacrifice, my sins are completely removed. I would talk to the Lord about the same thing ten times. And I finally understood he heard me the first time. But how patient he was with me through those years. Because I live with low self-esteem. I, I lived with a guilty conscience. I felt guilty all the time. Until I understand, right, that the blessings are real. And when I found out what Jesus did for me, that he was the Lamb of God, right? An animal, a typology of an animal that would be sacrificed. He was the Lamb of God who would shed his blood, not continually, once and for all. That his blood was spotless blood. So we have a better sacrifice. That means better blessings. So what happens to guilt and shame and condemnation? It's all washed away. My conscience is now cleansed because of Christ. So, because of a better sacrifice, everybody say better sacrifice. Better sacrifice. Here comes number two, better covenant. better covenant. Amen. The old covenant was, the, the pillars of the old covenant were the law. The pillars of the new covenant are grace. The law pronounced us guilty. Grace pronounces us forgiven. New covenant, better covenant. Ever say better covenant? better covenant? Number three, better promises. Our promises are now yes and in him, amen. Better promises. Jesus keeps the promises and they're provided for us. Ever say better promises? Better promises. All right. Number four, better mediator. Since we couldn't get to God, God came to man. Came to man in the person of Jesus Christ. And Jesus emptied himself so that he could come and identify with us, but still he maintained his proper identity as the Son of God. So he's known as the Son of Man and the Son of God. So he represents God to humanity and humanity back to God. And you know what we call that? If you were negotiating, what we call that is a mediator. He's the only one who can stand in the middle and represent both God and represent man accurately, personally, and he did that. There's one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. And because of that, that's why Jesus' statement of I'm the way, the truth, and the life is a truth that the church is called to uphold and preserve. And that makes the blessings real. So we have a mediator. We have a better resurrection. In the Old Testament, people were raised from the dead. But you know then, eventually they died. You know, everyone that Jesus physically raised from the dead in his ministry eventually died. But in the New Covenant, Jesus is described this way. He is the firstborn, firstborn, that's resurrection, among many sons and daughters that he may have preeminence. He was the first, and then after him there'll be multitudes and multitudes and multitudes that will experience resurrection because... Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. 
He who believes in me, though he will die, he will, he will never die but live forever. So we have a better resurrection. This physical body is going to pass away, but you're alive unto God. We serve a living God. To be absent from the body is to be in his presence. You just slip out of this, what we would call natural body, and you slip over into your eternal home. You have a better resurrection. And all of this makes the blessings of God real. We think and meditate and ponder these truths through the course of your week, then your spirit is built up. Your spirit is protected from deception. Your spirit is preserved because we live in a perverted world. We live in a very deceptive day and hour. But because of Jesus, we can know the truth and we can tell the truth to others. And that's the responsibility of the church that, no, there's a better sacrifice. People don't have to, to try to continue to work their way to get right with God. What an endless road that is. An impossibility. Just come and receive the sacrifice that Jesus gave. We had a better covenant. A covenant is something that's sacred. It's binding. It was purchased with the blood of Jesus Christ. We have better promises. God always says yes to his kids. The timing aspect of it, we get hung up on. But everything that Jesus suffered and died for is yours right now. It's on your account. It's better promises. It's a better mediator. It's a better resurrection. And then finally, it's this. We have a better home than what we have right now. Don't put all your stock in the here and now. But store up treasure in heaven. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Be good stewards of the homes that you have, the time that God has given you while you're here, of the talents, the gifts, the abilities that he's given unto you while you're here. But one of these days, all of those things will be something of the past. And we enter into eternity. And we have eternal home with God in heaven. And that's where we're going to be forever and ever and ever. And of his kingdom and of his glory and of his power, it will be no end. And we'll never grow weary. We'll never grow tired. We won't have any weaknesses in our flesh to weigh us down. We won't have a mind that is always trying to understand and analyze and figure everything out. And we'll be in his presence and we'll see him as he is and we'll know him and we'll be known. And it, that's a really large concept for us to try to grasp. But that's what's in store for those who love God. That is what God has preserved for those who love him. A real place. Scripture actually describes heaven like you would describe a country or a planet. There is going to be activity there, structure there. There's going to be governments there. There is going to be protocol there. And all of it will be something that is governed by the person in the presence of Jesus. You will know exactly what to do, when to do it, and how to do it. And it's not as if you'll be robotic. It will be like heaven is so, there's no darkness there. There's no night. It's always light. It's like a Alaska in the summertime for a few weeks. I mean, you know, the sun just doesn't go down. And we just can't even begin to comprehend that. And that's why the writer of the New Testament says, eye hasn't seen, ear hasn't heard, it hasn't even begun to enter into the heart of man, the things, the things, multitude of things that God has preserved for those that love him. Yeah. So we, as the people of God right now, are called to be the pillars of truth, to uphold the word of God and the standards of the word of God and the ministry and the teaching of the word of God. And not to twist it to our own destruction, 
The word of God is of no private interpretation. Scripture interprets scripture. And so it's important that we understand that God is asking us to know his word, to live in light of his word, and to share his word with others because it will be a blessing to them. All right, I'm going to ask you all to stand, to stand. And with every head bowed and every eye closed, my invitation, first of all, is to all the believers. I think that this message, first and foremost, needs to be something that we process. And so I'm just going to give this simple invitation, and that is that if you feel like the blessings of the Lord have been so distant, so far away. It doesn't mean that they're not real. Maybe it just means you and I need to realign ourselves with the blessing of God. Maybe we've moved away from the foundation of truth and we've begun to entertain some thoughts or ways or philosophies that really aren't in keeping with Christ. Christ's commands, Christ's call, Christ's commission. Maybe we've, you know, just picked up a lot of secondary messages instead of primary messages. Maybe we haven't been majoring on the majors is another way to say that. Maybe we've just gotten caught up in a lot of emotionalism. Maybe, we, you know, and it's just led us away from our first love. It's led us away from the foundation of our faith, which is Christ. He's our chief cornerstone. Maybe we started building our life around other agendas or other messages. And Christ is just calling us to himself because he's a jealous Savior. He loves us. He's zealous for that relationship with you. And of course he would be because he demonstrated that by giving his life for you. So you have tremendous value to Jesus. And that's why he pleads with us to come. That's why he wins us over and he sort of in a sense woos us back to himself but if you've found yourself drifting apart from Christ and the blessings seem to be drifting also I want to encourage you get yourself anchored once again in Christ in his word in his call his true call his true placement for you if that's you, I just want you to raise your hand while heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Thank you. Thank you. I see those hands. Just before the Lord. This is just between you and him. Just before the Lord. Now, Father, I thank you for those that raised their hand that the Holy Spirit now is guiding them back to Christ, to have a Christ-centered life, a Christ-focused life, because, Lord, that's a blessed life. Yeah, help them, Lord, with their responsibilities. Help them to know that you're with them in the everyday, ordinary activities of life. Parenting, grocery shopping, laundry, housekeeping, mowing the lawn, going to work, Lord, you're always with us. Forgive us for trying to say, well, you're with us here, not with, no. The blessings are real everywhere. We're blessed coming in and going out, lying down and rising up. We're blessed. Whatever we put our hand to is blessed. For some of you, those embers are being stirred again. That's the truth you've heard since you were a child. The blessing of Abraham are mine. I am the seed of Abraham, and you are. You're his offspring. You're blessed. Don't live under a curse. Live the blessed life. Be the people that God has called you to be, the people that show forth his praises. Lord, I thank you that you seal these decisions. Make it personal and make it real. And I thank you you protect them from the evil one. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. For those online, I trust that you've been following these same instructions, making the same decisions. If where you are, you need to reconnect with Christ. He's with you. 
It's one of the great truths about our Lord is he is ever present. When does his presence manifest? When do his blessings manifest? When we acknowledge his presence. And when is that? When we have holy goose pimples? <laughs> no. When you wake up in the morning, he's with you. Whether you can feel it or figure it out, he's there. And if you say, Lord, I thank you that you're here with me. I thank you that you gave, listen to this, a better sacrifice for a better covenant, for better promises, that you are my way back to the Father. You're my mediator. That one of these days, I'm going to experience resurrection and I'll be in your presence. You think that pulls you back to true north spiritually? Shuts the door to the enemy and his lies and deception? Protects and keeps you from wandering and sort of drifting away? I think it does. Primary things are primary things. Keep Christ primary in your life. But if you haven't come to faith in Christ, Christ has sacrificed his life for you. All he asks is that you come and accept him. And when you accept him, you accept his way of living. But he helps you to do that through the person of the Holy Spirit. And if you haven't come to faith in Christ or acknowledged your need for Christ, then Christ calls us to himself through a word called repentance. And that's just not saying, you know, I'm wrong and God, you're right. What repentance means is, God, I'm changing my mind about the way I think about you and the way I think about life. That's why Christ calls us to himself. And if you need Christ in your life and you haven't accepted him, if you would just understand, all you have to do is call upon his name and you'll be saved. How do you call upon his name? By faith. It's just something that you confess. Christ, I confess by faith. I need you as my Savior. I need you as my Lord. Online, you can do that right now. Just begin to acknowledge Christ. Come. Thank you for your forgiveness. Thank you for the new life you can give me. Thank you for mercy. Thank you for grace. And he comes. He promises that he comes. And the blessings that follow are real. Are real. And they're eternal, and they're for you. And the promises are real and eternal, and they're for you. Everything that Christ did was real, and it's for you. That's how much he cares about us. Amen. Amen. Let's all make this declaration. Heavenly Father, we thank you for a better covenant. We have this covenant, this sacred agreement. Because of Jesus. And we believe he's your only begotten son. That he suffered on a cross. For our sins. But on the third day. He was resurrected. And as your word says. He's alive forevermore. Thank you Jesus. For taking up residence. And living in me. Thank you for being my Lord. And my Savior. Amen. 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 If you made that decision for Christ today. You're online. There's instruction on the screen. Just follow that instruction. Reply. Get in touch with us. And God bless you. Welcome to the family of God. And for you as saints. It's so important. It's so important that you understand the church matters. We're here for a divine purpose. We're going to be talking more about that in the upcoming weeks. If you're not able to be with us in person, you know, stay connected and stay in touch with us through all of the different ways that we are broadcasting these messages, whether it's through YouTube, whether it's through our website, you know, whether it's through our podcast. And let's continue to stay built up in the days in which we live. For you are a chosen generation, a holy priesthood, right? A holy nation. That's who you are. You are the church of the living God. And that's a wonderful truth.
to meditate on. That I am my beloved's and my beloved is mine. You're one with the Lord. Just like a husband and wife are one with the Lord, you're one with Christ. This is part of the great plan of God. That's what makes everything so much better with Jesus. Right? You thought things were good. Here's old school. Ready? Get ready, all you old school people. You thought everything was better with blue bonnet on it. No. Everything's better because of Jesus. Thank you for watching today's message. If you'd like to know more about today's message or the ministry here at Living Word Fellowship in Knoxville, Iowa, please call 641 828 7119 or visit us online at lwfknoxville.com. If you are in the Knoxville, Iowa area, please stop by and see us on Sundays at 10 a.m. or Wednesdays at 7 p.m. at 321 East Robinson, where there's always something for everyone.